today. I really appreciate everyone taking a time out of their day to um, dive deeper into uh, the world of clutter, uh, the invisible weight of clutter. Um, and thank you especially to Stephen and the Wilmington Parks and Recreation Department for hosting this event. Um, it definitely seems very timely. Uh, I know that, um, you know, well-being, your your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health, all of those things are really important um, right now, especially. Um, and I think one of the pieces that is often overlooked in that kind of equation toward healthy living is your physical environment. Um, a lot of times people um, don't really factor that into their overall um, plan for a healthy lifestyle. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today and how your physical environment really does have an impact and can be another piece of finding that balance in your life and, and, and really striving toward the goals you have for a healthy, well-balanced life. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, just a little bit about my background. So I'm, I have a business called Seaside Styling and Organizing, and I, I am immersed in the world of people's belongings. That is the world in which uh, I live. Um, and so I, I know very much both from my own experience and from working with clients about that invisible weight that we carry with um, the things in our home. And so I'm gonna share a little bit more about that uh, today. Um, and I think with that, I'm gonna go ahead and jump over to the presentation. So bear with me just one minute as I get this switched over. Um, and as I'm going through, um, I, there will be time at the end for a question and answer. And um, if you have questions as we're going through this, feel free to put them in the chat room. Uh, I don't think I can do the presentation and monitor the chat room at the same time. I'm not sure I'm that coordinated, but we'll have time to answer those at the end or to just jump in um, at the end with the questions that you have. Um, I'll also share my contact information. So if we do somehow you know, run out of time, um, you can get a hold of me that way and we can continue the conversation. So uh, let's see. Can how's my screen sharing? Did it work? Someone can just chime in. Yes, I see it. That'd be helpful. <laughs> yes, I see it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. So then let's jump in. All right, so I wanted to start with this quote. This is actually the inspiration for this presentation today. That clutter is a weight that is built on top of you so gradually, you don't even realize anymore that it is holding you down. And uh, I found that out kind of firsthand as part of uh, my journey to understanding more about our belongings and, and in our environment through um, my experience um, when my husband and I were first married. Uh, the first 10 years of our marriage, we moved six times. <laughs> I just ended up working out that way. And uh, every time we moved, we went through this major purging process where I would have a garage sale, I would sell things on Craigslist, I would take a truckload of stuff to the donation center. Um, and then we'd pack up our things and unpack them in the new place and two years later I was going through the exact same thing. I was having a garage sale, I was hauling stuff to the donation center and and after three or four or five times of doing that I started to notice that you know what's going on here? Why is it that in less than two years we've accumulated so much excess in our home? that I have enough to have an entire garage sale again and to, to, to do all that. I, it just really gave me pause and helped me to just kind of think about there's an intake problem. I'm, I'm taking in more in my home than I'm than I'm outputting. And so that was one part of that um, process. And then the other thing I learned was that if we hadn't moved <laughs> every two years, all of that stuff would just be sitting in our house still. You know, it was the process of moving that got us to really address what we owned. And if I'd been in my house for five, 10, 30 years, 
that would all just be gradually building up and building up exactly like this quote says, where you don't even realize it. I, I was always shocked. Every time we moved, I was shocked that we had so much stuff. I'm like, how is this possible? <laughs> Why do I have eight garbage bags of throw pillows? Like, where did those come from? I don't even know. Um, my husband's like, yeah, I've told you we have a lot of throw pillows, um, but I didn't really see it until I actually saw it. Um, so, so that's kind of the background. Um, and then it turns out that I was actually not alone in this. So I have some statistics I'm going to share with you um, that kind of highlight um, what's going on with our stuff situation. Um, so here's the first one. Um, the average home size in the US has nearly tripled in the last 50 years. Three times bigger. Only 25% of US garages are actually used for parking cars. 75% of our garage storage space, not like 75% of the space, but like of all garages total, <laughs> are housing our belongings instead of our cars. And even with that, cars that are, or, or garages that are packed and houses that are three times bigger, one out of every 10 Americans rents offsite storage. And that's actually the fastest growing segment of commercial real estate and it has been over the past four decades. The average American home has 300,000 items. 300,000. The average 10 year old owns 238 toys. So if there are any moms and dads on the line and you feel like you're constantly picking up toys around the house, it's <laughs> it's likely because you are. That's a lot to maintain. That's a lot to contain um, in a in a space. And then this one really got me. Uh, American women will spend an average of twenty five thousand one hundred and eighty four hours of their lives shopping for household essentials. And that's not even including shopping for fun or shopping for gifts and things like that. That's just the essentials. That's the equivalent of 24 hours a day of shopping for three years straight. <laughs> and even for someone who likes to shop, that's a lot of shopping. Um, so then here's one more is that humans own more possessions now than ever before in human history. So if we're feeling overwhelmed in our homes and if we're feeling like there is too much, it's because there really, there really is. <laughs> there, is there is more than there's ever been before. Um, there's a great interview with the, uh, the director of sustainability of IKEA. And, and this was in 2019, and he, and he actually is quoted as saying that the West has reached peak stuff. And, and he coined that phrase that we have, we don't need any more candle holders or dish towels or coffee tables. We have like, we're maxed out. <laughs> and that's the sustainability coordinator of Ikea, which is like, you know, one of the biggest uh, manufacturers of goods. Um, and so here's, I think, kind of a really great visual. This is from a book um, by Peter Menzel, it's called Material World. He did this amazing project, he's a photographer, where he, he traveled the world and he took pictures of families um, with all of the contents of their homes um, displayed on their front lawns, and he took pictures of it. And this is an American family, this is in the US, and I mean, when you think of those statistics, I bet there's 300,000 items there. <laughs> And 238 toys at least. I can I can see all. So we consume and we own and then we feel burdened by it. <laughs> so so how does this happen? I think it's important to kind of contextualize this. Like where where are we right now in our society as consumers, um, and and what's contributing to that? And so there are a few factors. Like one is that it's easier than ever before in human history <laughs> to access goods, right? You can sit at your computer and imagine pretty much anything in the world that you want, and you can, with a click of a button, have it delivered to your doorstep in less than 48 hours, and you often don't even have to pay shipping. <laughs> it, it's pretty amazing, right? So the accessibility um, is like nothing we've ever seen before. You can, you know, and, and people, 
shop online when they're bored, when they're stressed, when they're watching TV and they're watching all these advertisements and then all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, look at that. That's that's pretty cool. I think I'll get on and check it out, right? So we just, it's just really easy. Um, and so we don't necessarily think about the other side of that, right? The other side of that is that, well, now where are we going to put it <laughs> um, in our house? And, and is this really going to have long-term uh, happiness impact or is it just a short-term little buzz? Um, the other side is the, the price point. You know, it's, it's price used to be a barrier for a lot of people for ac accumulating things and, and things are just so inexpensive now. I mean, I had a client who just a couple weeks ago had picked up 20 desk lamps at the dollar store because it was like, oh my gosh, like it's a desk lamp for a dollar, right? <laughs> so like bought 20 of them and it was like, what are you going to do with 20 desk lamps, you know? And But it was that, that thrill of the deal that like that little jolt we get when we've gotten a good deal on something and that kind of fuels this um, this spending and this shopping that that we get like excited. At least that was a big thing for me. When I got a good deal on something, it didn't matter if I loved it or needed it <laughs> or had a place for it. It was a good deal. <laughs> and that's one of the habits that I've been working really hard on trying to uh, notice and address. Um, um, and then we're also seeing this, you know, the idea of the peak stuff, right? There's this author, James Wallman, and he called it stuffication, right? That we are suffocating under the weight of all of our stuff. And so, so if we've reached peak stuff and we've kind of shifted way on one side of this pendulum of, of, of accumulation and, and have having things around us, there's naturally going to be a movement toward the opposite direction. And so if you've noticed, you know, that there's a whole new movement now around minimalism. Um, this is a really popular book. It's The Minimalist Home by Joshua Becker. And, you know, and he's kind of the father of the modern minimalist movement where it's this idea that you let go of all of this excess free up your resources to invest in the things that you truly value in your life and just keep what you need and letting the rest of it go and there's also the the tiny house movement i mean there i think there's a connection between why we're seeing like you know, if we are going to these huge homes to now there's this movement of like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> what if we just did this a little differently? What if we rethought some of these ideas that we have? Um, there's also another, this is part of the work I do. I'm, I'm also a Kamari consultant. Um, when I was going through all that moving and purging and recognizing that there was something going on that I wasn't really aware of, that was in 2015. That's when she released this book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And that was part of what drew me into uh, her, this work and, and really helping people apply her method in their homes was that um, it's, she has the thought that you choose what brings you joy, you, that, you, that you have a more intentional lens. It's not minimalism because that's about just what you need, but it is about being intentional and selective about what you're bringing into your home and what you're keeping in your home. And I know that this is on people's minds because since 2015, she's sold over 8 million copies of her book. <laughs> so this isn't just a, a US problem. This is all over the world. Like people all over the world are feeling the weight of the clutter and the stuff. So then I want to talk a little bit about um, finding that balance, right? What, what that really shows us is that people are seeking a balance, right? We're looking to have a more balanced life. We're looking to, to kind of use our resources in more intentional ways. Um, and so there are definitely some benefits if by reducing. Um, and so you have less time searching for things, right? When you get rid of the, the things, the extra, you have the things that you need and and it just takes that right out of the equation right you just the things that you need and use are readily available to you you also 
spend less time cleaning. Right? There's you're not having to dust and pick up and you know move furniture and all of those things. Um, it saves you time cleaning as well. You also spend less time shopping. That's been a huge one, you know, reclaiming some of those 25,000 hours <laughs> that we're going to spend uh, shopping. Um, I also meant to share that, you know, uh, on Amazon, they sell every minute, every minute, Amazon sells 4,000 items. So by, by the end of our presentation, they'll have sold like almost 300,000 items just, just in the time that we've been speaking together. I think it, in a day it's like 5.5 million in a 24 hour period. Um, so we, we can kind of maybe modify that a little bit. And then this is one that I found really interesting is that I, I know I think anecdotally we recognize that a calm and orderly and, and de decluttered environment is more peaceful, but they actually did a study. Uh, this was in one of the books um, that I've referenced earlier. It's um, Life at Home in the 21st Century. And they did a study of participants that they actually measured their cortisol levels. That's the stress hormone that's released. Um, in calm environments and in disorderly environments. And especially for women, their stress hormones were actually like measurably higher when they were in environments that were um, disorganized and cluttered. It wasn't as much of an impact for the men. I, I think we could probably speculate on, on why that is, but for a, in a lot of homes, the, the women tend to take on more of that um, responsibility and so if you're feeling that that's your responsibility then you're you're going to have a more um, physical reaction to uh, having it not be um, the way you kind of envisioned it or, or wanted it um, so then what do you gain um, you gain more money in your savings account I mean I if you're really being intentional and if you're if you've reduced to the point that you are like, I know what I have um, and I, I know what I need, um, then you can actually start saving more money. And also it reduces the, that um, replacement. You know, I mean, I, how many times you go out and you, you think you're out of something because you can't find it. And then, you know, two weeks later, you're like, oh my gosh, there it was. <laughs> um, so if you reduce, you can more easily see what you have. And so you're not actually spending the extra money on things that you you already had you just didn't know where they were <laughs> um, it also opens up opportunities and experiences um, and and that's with part of it can be the, the the time the energy the money that you're saving you know you can invest that in other areas um, my husband and I actually now we we don't really even give gifts at the holidays or special occasions because instead we we save that money we would have spent on something and we plan a, a fun vacation or a weekend, you know, getaway at a bed and breakfast or, you know, something that's really special and something that's going to build memories. And um, to me, that's so much more valuable than a, a, a piece of jewelry that will honestly sit in my jewelry box probably 364 four days a year, maybe even more. <laughs> um, and then more importantly, it gives you more time for living, for in investing that into the life style that you want and the things that you enjoy and the people you enjoy spending time with. Uh, Joshua Becker, that's he's the, the author of The Minimalist Home. He had his uh, kind of moment where he was spending it another Saturday cleaning his garage. And he just realized, you know, I this isn't how I want to spend my time. I, I don't want to spend my time in um, organizing my garage again. And that's where he realized that really, in order to ha not have to do this all the time, I need, I'm just going to reduce what I have to organize. Because uh, organized clutter is still clutter, right? If you, if you pack it away in a nice little labeled bin, it's still there. Um, it hasn't really gone away. It's just been kind of tucked away. Um, and then this is, um, I worked with, um, this is from one of my clients and when we were partway through the process, this is 
exactly what she said to me as we were working through her home and she said you know it just it feels like freedom it feels like freedom and i and i felt the same way when i was going through the process in my home is that there was just that weight right that in, that invisible weight that's built around us you can just start to feel it lifting and it feels incredibly freeing So if I've piqued your interest at all and you're interested in this idea, um, I put together a list of some resources that I found to be super helpful. Um, the first two books um, I've actually already mentioned, they were The, the Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up and The Minimalist Home. There's also another great book called Enough. It's Finding More by Living with Less. That's by Will Jr. Davis. Um, if you're not really, or if you prefer to watch or you don't want one more book <laughs> in your in your house, um, there are also some great um, films out there on Netflix. Um, there's a great documentary called A Minimalism. Um, just a fair warning, it's it'll probably make you want to move into a tiny house and sell everything you own. At least <laughs> that's what it had an impact it had on me. And then Marie Kondo, actually, not just her 8 million copies, she even has a, a highly successful show on Netflix called Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. And then there's a, a short, it's only 20 minutes long, it's called The Story of Stuff by Annie Leonard, and it's uh, online, and it just kind of gives you a, a, a brief history of consumerism and the impact that it has had on our environment. And it's a really good, um, quick, little video to just get you thinking about um, where does our stuff go after it leaves our home and how does it get to our home to begin with <laughs> uh, and then a couple of podcasts and um, the life cycle of stuff with there's a fresh air interview with uh, author adam minter and and he goes through kind of the whole cycle of how are things made and then where do they end up um, in their during their uh, their lifetime and then there's also the Spark Joy podcast, and that goes into, it's more, again, Marie Kondo's method, and they really talk about that idea of uh, aligning your values and your lifestyle to create a home and a life that supports you and lifts you up and um, brings you joy. <laughs> Um, and then this is kind of the last slide actually here again like I'm also a resource I love this work this is what I'm super passionate about and I spend my time <laughs> doing I do have an awesome class um, coming up in February there this was the fall one but um, uh, through the community enrichment program that we're going to be doing a, a six week deep dive um, where you get some support if you are interested in starting this transformation process um, it's a really um, it's a really great way to do that um, and then I'm also you can also subscribe on my website um, I have a newsletter that I send out once a month um, at seasidestyling.com and you can also find me on social media if you're I share all sorts of my my journey and my well client permission willing <laughs> clients journey and little tips and tricks along the way so those are all of the different places I think you can find me um, if, especially if you don't get a chance to have your questions answered today. So that's it. That was a lot of information. I'm going to jump back over to end my screen share and go back to video. So I think I'm back. Right. Am I Am I back? <laughs> You're back. I'm back. OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, so I mean, so I guess now I mean, if there I was going to check over in the chat room to see if there's any questions or it doesn't look like there are any there. But um, does anyone have any questions or things that you were thinking about during this that I can, you know, that we can chat about or? answer for you unmute and share it that way oh, I saw that oh. how like do you start 
How do you start? That's a great question. Um, so I think if it's like any other kind of big undertaking or, or a, a goal that you're kind of setting for yourself or a shift in the way you're thinking about things is it starts with kind of a, that vision, right? Envisioning yourself getting to the other side and, and what does that look like? You know, what do you want to get from the process? What do you want your home to look like, to feel like? What do you want your life to look like and feel like on the other side of the process? Um, and if you start there, then you can see, OK, then if this is where I want to go. I can hit what are the steps to to get me there? But it really starts with right, picturing that that end goal so that you can break it down into smaller steps. And I see Kelly's uh, comment. It's overwhelming getting started or it's overwhelming. Getting started is hard because you don't see results right away. Um, and and I, I definitely think that's true. It's that when you are like in it, in the thick of it, it can be hard to see or tell that you're making progress. And so, so a strategy to work with that, there's um, one of them is to start with what's visible to you. So because that gives you kind of that instant gratification that like, oh my gosh, like Look how much better it looks and um, so even starting and um, this is not uh, just to clarify this is not that Marie Marie Kondo has a very specific method that she recommends um, and that's the, the KonMari method is all about category you start with a specific category and you can break it down that way um, rather than a space but some people have found it helpful especially if you're feeling overwhelmed to start with like the surfaces you know, start with a, a surface on your home um, that's a hot spot for clutter and tackle that. And then that will give you kind of that like, OK, I can see a result here, but um, and, and kind of give you that reward. Does that kind of, I don't know, does that help at all? OK. <laughs> Thanks. I have a question. Oh, I have a question. I don't yeah. know how this works. Okay. I can't I see. You. Okay. Um, so how much time do you spend? Because I literally just started my process again, like as far as our my bedrooms. And um I'm proud of myself because laundry i'm a family of six so laundry is the biggest headache like i don't mind washing and drying but once they come out the dryer i'm like here just <laughs> go and fight and so um so i'm proud of myself though i tackled like one of like so the clothes end up in i'm telling all my business but it's okay i no shame um all our clothes end up in our our master bedroom like you know me and my husband's bedroom and then, um, you know, the process goes from there, like distributing them, getting them to kids rooms and et cetera. So like what I was doing was like I find a show that's like 30 to 40 minutes and just stay in tune with the clothes, like getting them in, in groups like of who's whose clothes is whose mm -hmm. and then putting them back that way. Is that too much time spent on it, like 30, 40 minutes or like? Should I be doing more of like let like smaller increments so I won't feel as over? Well, I'm not saying I feel overwhelmed, but of course, when you see the power, when you see the amount, it's like, OK, this can happen. Another like you push it off like mm -hmm. be some like type of. Some other type of motivation, because for me, it's just like, OK, just get it done. But it's like to click your mind, like some type of motivation. I need something else in my head to say you do you get what I'm trying to say like what do you mm -hmm. say to your clients when they have those moments or like yeah they have their their thing you know spending the 30 minutes or 40 minutes on it but to just don't stop like what 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 do you say like what what type of quote or what type of motivation do you give to in you. those moments where where you want to pass it off but you you still do it yeah, no, I think I think that's a great um, example. And I think you've actually done something that's often very 
useful and successful is you've linked something enjoyable to a task that you don't maybe find so enjoyable like laundry. So you've linked watching a show and, and having some time to do that with a with this task. So that's actually I mean that that's actually really great because you're, you're now kind of it doesn't feel so arduous anymore if you're linking it to something positive. Um, mm -hmm. But it really if it if it's feeling like if that if it doesn't feel like it's working for you, um, one of the things that I recommend doing is is timing how long it takes to fold a load of laundry, a load of laundry, um, because sometimes sometimes we can build up how long something is going to take. We can build it up in our head, and then if we actually sit down and do it, it doesn't take as long as we think. Yeah. Now I don't know a family of six like that. That does sound like it probably could take some time <laughs> to get all the laundry, um, but then there's. There's also the other piece of this, which is if you go back to kind of the core of this, the reducing piece, right? The more you can reduce, like the less time you're going to have, like if there's actually less laundry because there's less, you know, you're using maybe fewer towels or maybe using, it, you know, like that reducing piece can can really pay off in a lot of ways too. But that's tricky because you might not get your family on board with with their <laughs> reducing how many clothes like the clothes that they own right away does that help at all yeah that helps so because and that's funny you say that because i literally started like so like now every friday if i don't do it on friday because you know virtual learning is real <laughs> it sucks all the energy um so if i don't friday but the end of the week yeah you can get whatever clothes you want i'm um, sorry um but by the end of the week i get all whatever blankets they use you know if they took naps mm -hmm. or whatever or you know any towels out of bathrooms like i go mm -hmm. ahead and wash them and then that remains their same kind of towel and washcloth for you know like a month you know for that month or something like that like and then mm -hmm. i'll change them so that i thank you for saying that because i was like okay am i because I kind of thought about daycare because, you know, like every week they give your kids blanket back to say, OK, it's time to wash it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like the mindset I had. Well, one of the thought processes I had when it came to like the towels and blankets and stuff is like, OK, it's the end of the week. Yeah. Less. And so I thank you yeah. for saying that. that wasn't far yeah, off of course. That. Yeah. And, and try and again routines are really great too so maybe it's like okay friday is my like that's my towel day like this is when i do towels and and it just makes it a little more automatic and I'll, and it can feel you know routines are helpful not just for kids but, you know adults like routines too <laughs> so it just takes that we don't have to like think about it anymore we just know okay friday's that day and that's when i do it and that's when i get to watch my show and you know you can kind of make it a fun thing <laughs> so well, definitely okay I thank you so much. But do you have any special, like, I don't know, like quotes or things that you say to your clients um, when they're trying to start the process or just trying to maintain the process of decluttering and stuff? Ooh, that's a that's a good question. Um, it's probably like you know when you're in the moment, you probably say your stuff, you know, but your isms. But I was just yeah. Curious. Yeah, that's a tough one because everyone's everyone's situation is so different, and so everyone kind of needs to hear something, you know, at, at different times depending on on what the struggle is. <laughs> um, but there there okay. is a piece, yeah. So I don't know if I have anything like specific that that is like my go to. I don't I don't know if I have that, <laughs> but maybe I need one. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Great. Well, I appreciate you so much. Yeah, thank you for for jumping in and sharing, and good luck with your with with getting getting your process going. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we probably have time maybe for like I don't know one more, and then it's probably time to jump off and get ready for the lunch break. Um, let's see, is there another what came through the um. For some reason, I'm not seeing the chat. Oh, yeah, hard. It's hard to tackle the clutter and keeping up with the day to day tasks. 
Yes, it is. Yeah, and that that goes back to that that reducing. I know it's hard to hear, but if you feel like you're constantly picking things up and constantly um, that that's your life. I know that same client that I that had the quote that said it just feels like freedom, you know, and it, she was also just like, I don't this isn't how I want to spend my life. You know, I don't want to spend my life picking up my house like there's just more to life than this. And if that's how you're feeling, then even though it might seem like a big shift or a big stretch, I would really encourage you to check out some of these resources and, and to just play around with this idea of and trying to reduce and just see if that starts to lift that burden a little bit. Because if, if clutter is not just not putting things away, clutter is also that gradual buildup, right? Where, or all of a sudden your cabinets and your drawers and your closets are packed and there really isn't room <laughs> for that stuff just kind of, get, you know, gets packed in. So um, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and and here, I think, um, oh, there's one more question. Let's see. Well, hi, Janet. <laughs> Do you have advice on getting rid of clothes that really don't look that great, but you seem to have a sentimental attachment to? Oh, I love that question. So uh, my advice for clothes that have sentimental value, and that's true for so many people. Like it, that is, if you feel like, oh my gosh, like there's something wrong with me because I can't get rid of this, um, even though I don't wear it, that's, there's nothing wrong with you. That's a lot of people struggle with that um, and my recommendation is to pull the you don't have this is what I love about the KonMari method is that if it has meaning to you keep it and keep it with confidence right it's not about getting rid of all of the stuff that that you own it's getting rid of all the stuff that's stressing you out and that you don't even care about keeping so that you can pay attention to the things you really love and like your your clothing so to get back to the clothing piece is to to take those out of the closet you know because if they're not something you're actually going to put on and wear then they really are cluttering your closet because your purpose of your closet is to help you get dressed and so my recommendation is to pull those sentimental items out and and keep them in a in a special place you know and so when you feel like going down memory lane of like i remember when we went to that dinner or i remember that special event you can open up that box and you can go down memory lane and it can be a joyful experience instead of a like oh my gosh like why is this in my closet i'm never gonna wear it right it, it, does that help <laughs> okay great um papers old bills and statements oh goodness oh yeah the paper category the paper category is the is a big one um again it's the more you can reduce the less you have to deal with the more you can reduce on the front end there's some really great resources out there that talk about like what what papers you need to keep forever what papers you need to keep just temporarily and then what can you just you know keep for a, a month or less and then get them out the door so that reducing piece is super helpful for for bills and statements um okay well i feel like you know it's it's almost noon um i know we i think we were supposed to end technically at 45 after but we started a little late so um Again, please reach out to me. My email is Lydia at SeasideStyling.com if you have more questions that we didn't get to. Um, and thank you. Thank you for, for joining in today. I hope to hear from you. Um,